Well, today we're going to get into Leviticus chapter 15 and uh, talk a bit more about some of the purification rites that uh, the children of Israel had to deal with. So this one is dealing with uh, cleansing those who've had a discharge or, or other types of uncleanness. So not the most exciting thing to read in the scriptures, but it makes it some interesting understanding for us of what was it like back then? How did they deal with things? Uh, and sometimes we can look at that in our day and age and see how we still do some things in a similar way. So let's jump into this one. Uh, verse 1, the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, saying, which, of course, that means when the Lord's speaking to you, this is a revelation. So you kind of have to look at this book like what we would look at the Doctrine and Covenants today. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when any man hath a running issue out of his flesh, because of his issue, he is unclean. So a running issue out of his flesh, what does that mean? That most likely is talking about some kind of a uh, discharge. Maybe they're bleeding out, which means they're unclean. They have to go through a process of, of purification. Uh, maybe they have, uh, this could be also considered like if you have a sinus congestion, a lot of stuff coming out uh, because you're sick. Maybe you have an infection or something going on. Maybe you have uh, a wound that is infected and it's got pus and things coming out of it as well. Those are all things that could be potentially classified in this. So verse three, and this shall be his uncleanness in his issue, whether his flesh run with his issue or his flesh be stopped from his issue, it is his uncleanness. Every bed whereon he lieth that hath the issue is unclean and everything whereon he sitteth shall be unclean. Whosoever toucheth his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. He that sitteth on anything whereon he sat that hath the issue shall wash his clothes, bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. He that touches the flesh of him that hath the issue shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. So the, the thing that's important to look at this is if someone has something coming out of their body, basically, <clears throat> um, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, if somebody threw up, that would be technically considered this as well. Um, if any of that comes out, that person is declared unclean, which means they don't associate with people for a period of time. They stay away. They basically social distance for a little bit of time. If you touch somebody who is unclean, you touch their clothes, you touch their bed, or anything that they have touched or messed with, those all things are unclean. And if you touch them, then you're unclean till the end of the day. So you have to social distance, basically, as well. So this is what they did. And, and now, if you look at it, okay, if you're dealing with somebody, they've thrown up, they've got blood, uh, they've got you know congestion from a cold or an infection, they've got an infected wound, they have something coming out of the body, and you touch it or you get near them, we understand today when we look at the concepts of germ theory and, and uh, you know, talking about viruses and bacteria, that they can spread, they can be communicable. So you need to wash yourself and protect yourself and clean yourself after dealing with that and then stay away from others. So it limits the ability for you to spread it. That's basically what they're doing. They're using social distancing and they're cleaning and taking care of themselves, hygiene. Basically, it's really fascinating. Not social distancing like what we think of today with weeks and weeks. You know, it was either to the end of the day or the next seven days. So something that's interesting. Uh, now, verse 8, if he that hath the issue spit upon him that is clean, then he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. What saddle soever he rideth upon that hath the issue shall be unclean. Whosoever touches anything that was under him shall be unclean until the even. He that beareth any of those things shall wash his clothes, bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. Whomsoever he toucheth that hath the issue, and hath not raised his hands, rinsed his hands in water, <clears throat> excuse me, he shall wash his clothes, bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. And the vessel of earth that he toucheth, which hath issue, shall be broken. Every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. So if they touch a vessel like a clay pot, the clay pot's gone. You just throw it away. Basically, it's gone. Uh, and, and I think there, there's an important point to look at this, <coughs> excuse me, uh, because clay pots are porous, okay? So if you have a clay pot, if you are bleeding, 
And, and they kind of take it to the extreme here of like, oh, I could be bleeding from my arm, my left arm, and I touch a pot with my right hand, it gets destroyed. Um, but, you, you know, if you are infected and you touch something, germs can live on surfaces and pots are porous. So if you have something coming out of you and it gets into that, gets onto that pot, you know, you touch your wound and you touch the pot, you're going to have blood stay in that pot. It'll go into the, the little porous pieces of it. Uh, in fact, there's a story in about ancient Rome uh, where the scientists actually discovered a, a place where there's just tons and tons of broken pottery. And they believe what it was is they were using this pottery to store oil in. The problem is the oil seeps into the pores of the pot and then goes rancid. So they can't reuse that. They can only use that pot so many times to store oil and then the pot has to be thrown away. And so they, they believe there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pots in this pile that were destroyed. So they, they weren't like Tupperware where you just wash it out and you're good to go. They just had to get rid of them because the oils were in the pot itself, into the pores in the pot, and it would go rancid. And that would make any new oil you put in go bad faster. So they just had to get rid of the pot. So that's kind of this kind of a, a way to think about this as well. Um, <clears throat> all right, verse 13, and he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue. Then he shall number himself seven days for his cleansing and wash his clothes, bathe his flesh in running water and shall be clean. On the eighth day, he shall take to him two turtle doves, two young pigeons, come before the Lord unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, give them unto the priest. The priest shall offer them one for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering. Remember those, go look back at the to early parts of Leviticus to learn more about those, the difference of those. The priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord for his issue. So even though, even though you got sick, you something happened, you know, and uh, you got injured or sick or something, you had a problem, you got healed, you still went and paid a price with the sacrifices of for an atonement. Now, that kind of, to us, that might be like, oh, that seems kind of strange. You're healed. Don't worry about it after that. But we have to realize that the point of the law of Moses is not just to help these people in their everyday life to function, to stay clean, to watch out for communicable diseases and other problems and things that they'll run into in their, in their just normal life. Uh, but they also are, the law of Moses is there to help them understand how God blesses them and helps them. And this chapter points out uh, something that is really important that I think most people forget when we think about the atonement of Jesus Christ. We, I believe most people think about Jesus Christ's atonement as this idea of, oh, he paid the price for my sins. So it's more of a spiritual problem that he helped solve for me. And his atonement doesn't help me in a, in a physical way. And that's wrong. Actually, it does help you. He has experienced every sickness, every pain, every suffering, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, uh, any of it. If you can experience it, he did experience it. And because of that, okay, he didn't necessarily do that so that he could, there wasn't a price to pay because you got a broken arm. All right. Uh, that's not necessarily what it was. It gave him perfect love for you. Because he knows exactly, exactly what you are going through in your life. Everything. He knows it. He knows what it feels like. He understands what it's like to be there. And that gives him perfect empathy to help us. Because he has perfect empathy and perfect love, he has the ability to judge. That is super, 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 super important. We don't, I think we forget that those two points come together. Okay, mercy and justice are two very important concepts of the gospel. Most people like to think about justice more than mercy because it sounds more fun and it's more worldly and Satan wants us to focus on justice. Now, why does Satan want us to focus on justice? It's because mercy is the more important principle. Satan wants to distract us by doing what we feel is righteous and justice and justified versus loving and showing mercy. 
the whole point of Savior's life is to help us understand mercy. Okay, God tells us in the scriptures, it is for us to forgive everyone. He can forgive who he chooses. And why is that? It's because he has perfect love, perfect understanding of mercy. Therefore, he can understand justice. Now, this is not unlike the concept of dealing with teaching your children about fire. Okay, when you have a three-year-old, you don't teach a three-year-old how lighters and matches work because they'll burn your house down. They'll burn the neighborhood down. They'll burn all the fields around you down because they don't understand how that works. Okay, they'll make a mess, basically, if you teach them how to do fire. So you teach them to avoid the fire. And then as they get older, you teach them how to deal with the fire once they understand how to respect and control the fire. So it's not unlike that, okay? God wants us to learn mercy first. And if we learn mercy first, we will have no problems with justice. That is the important point, okay? It's not about justice. It's about mercy. This is what forgiveness is all about, okay? Forgiveness, there's a great quote, big quote from Abraham Lincoln. where He wrote like this big letter about forgiveness. That was something that he had a really hard time with in his life. He really, really was bad at forgiveness for many, many years because he believed that justice was more important. That's why he was an attorney. He believed that doing the right, exacting justice on people, those kinds of things, getting, you know, winning the arguments, showing yourself better, superior to others, that was important. And uh, it wasn't until after he became president that he started to realize that forgiveness is really the important thing. And uh, forgiveness is not about them. Forgiveness is about you, okay? Trust is about them. Forgiveness is about you. They don't even have to know you've forgiven them. But because if you don't forgive them, you're going to hold that and it's going to fester and cause problems in your body. Louise Hayes has a great book, Feelings Buried Alive Never Die. So any emotional feelings you try to bury and hold on to, they'll just turn into physical problems for you later on. So uh, it's a great book. Um, and this is the challenge. So forgiveness helps you to let go of that so that you can improve your life. Forgiveness isn't about helping them. It's about helping you. This is mercy. This is what it's about. We talk about the law of consecration. I, I know on several videos I've talked about this. The law of consecration is not about the stuff. That's justice. It's about the people. When you love your neighbors so much that you will lower your standard of living to help them, that is a law of consecration. And it's about loving your neighbor, not about having equal stuff with your neighbor. So it's mercy. Okay? And that's really what he's trying to get across in this too and help the children of Israel understand by doing the atonement sacrifice, they have to understand that Christ did pay this price. Christ knows what this is like. His atonement is helping me with this part of my life. Even if it's a sickness, injuries, pains, problems, he is covering it. He is helping us with that. So always remember that in your life. There's always at least one other person who knows exactly what you're experiencing. And he loves to talk with you about it. Unload your burdens on him. Pray to him. Let him know what you're feeling because he knows exactly what that is like. And since he knows what your world is like, he knows how to help you perfectly with, from within your world to get the help you need. Always look at prayer and Christ to help you with those things. Very, very important. Okay. Very, very, very important to look at. All right. Now let's move on because this chapter is changing a little bit. We're talking about something different now after this. So starting with verse 16, he says, If any man's seed of copulation go out from him, then he shall wash all his flesh in water and be unclean until the even. And every garment and every skin whereon the seed is the seed of copulation shall be washed with water and be unclean until the even. So this is talking about semen, basically. If a man ejaculates and it gets, it gets everywhere, everything needs to be cleaned up. And he's unclean until he is. You can't mess with him, can't hang out with him. He's got a social distance till the end of the day, basically, for the most part. So verse 18, the woman also with whom man shall lie with seed of copulation, they shall both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the even. So even if she gets it on her or in her, either way, she has to clean, basically. 
Verse 19, if a woman have an issue and her issue in her flesh be blood, she shall be put apart seven days. And whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean until the even. Now, this is talking about menstrual cycles in this one. Okay, a little bit different than we talked about before with like sicknesses or other things. This is more of bodily fluids, natural situations, okay? Verse 20, and everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sitteth upon shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. So everything needs to be cleaned. And if, a, if a, another person messes with the, the unclean items or with that woman, then they're unclean for the end of the day. But the woman is unclean for seven days. So this turned into a, a thing we can look in history and see that there was kind of a, I guess, a way that this got translated out. Uh, and this is probably where it originates from is in some cultures, they have a house that when a woman is on her menstrual cycle, she basically moves to that house for a week till her cycle is done. And then she comes home uh, that or, or there's like a shed that she would go to to, to live in temporarily. And that's how we see that sometimes in ancient cultures or ideas. And I think this is kind of where it came from was this was the law of Moses probably started this, or this was similar to some other rites and the rituals they had at the time too. Uh, verse 23, and if it be on her bed or on anything where she sitteth, when he toucheth it, he shall be unclean till the even. If any man lie with her at all and her flowers be upon him, he shall be unclean seven days and all the bed whereon he lieth shall be unclean. So if, if a man sleeps with her while she is on her period, he is unclean for seven days, basically. Verse 25, if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if a, if a run beyond the time of her separation, meaning some, she's got you know, heavy flow or, or problems, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. So you just have to wait until it's done you, and then get it taken care of, and then you can go back. Uh, I think this was kind of... Uh, in a way, this is this is turned into a bad thing for women. I mean, think about it. If you had to basically leave, couldn't live at home, you had to go live in another shack or somewhere else for seven days or however long it took to, de to deal with that, and you can't deal with other people, you're not going out hanging out with friends, you're not dealing with the rest of your family or anything like that, uh, that's a lot of time off. I mean, that's that's got to be a huge disruption for women's lives. And uh, ladies, if any of you are, are watching, uh, any, any women watching this, uh, I, you know, put in the comments if you'd like to, what would happen if you had to sit out that time, basically, what would that, how would that change your life? I mean, that's definitely very, uh, not conducive with how modern life is, but that's what they had to do back then. Granted, they didn't have as much stuff going on like we have today. So it, it might not have made a big, as big of a difference, but it, I'm sure it still made a difference. And uh, still, I think it caused, in some ways, how it was applied, it caused animosity. It caused some, some hurt feelings for people, uh, which is sad. That's not what these laws are intended for. They're just intended to help deal with problems and challenges that could arise. Um, let's see. Verse, uh, let's see, verse 26, I believe. Every, every bed whereon she lieth. In the days of her issue shall be unto her as the bed of her separation, and whatsoever she sitteth upon shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her separation. Whosoever touches those things shall be unclean, shall wash his clothes, bathe himself in water, and be unclean until even. But if she be cleansed of her issue, then she shall number to herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. So as soon as it's done, seven days, and then you go back. On the eighth day she shall take unto her two turtles, or two young pigeons, bring them unto the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. The priest shall offer for uh, shall offer the one for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for her before the Lord for the issue of her uncleanness. So even, even menstrual cycles, you had to go do these sacrifices to, be, uh, to make an atonement. So again, the atonement covers our pains, our problems, our challenges. And Heavenly Father, or Jesus knows exactly what's going on with us and how to help us, which is wonderful. Uh, it's fascinating, though, because there is no atonement 
uh, made for for sex, basically. You clean it up, you're unclean for the day, but then you're good. You don't have to do the sacrifice atonement. Only if you're sick or menstruating, that's when those things happen. Because I think they kind of looked at that as kind of like a sickness. You know, I'm sure they lumped it into a similar category back then. Uh, verse 31, thus shall you separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, that they die not in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. This is the law of him that hath an issue and of him whose seed goeth from him and is defiled therewith. And of her that is sick of her flowers and of him that hath an issue of the man and of the woman and of him that lieth with her that is unclean. So that's, it's fascinating that this is in here. I bet you most people don't even realize that these kinds of laws are here, uh, but it is what they had to do and how that we can think about how that impacted their life. But it's important to understand that we, want our focus when we have challenges and problems to be on the atonement. And I think that's something that we need to think about more in our day and age is how can we keep Christ as a focus of our life and his atonement as a key thing that we think about and ask for help. Anytime you have sicknesses, pains, problems, you have more claim on the atonement. If somebody does something and it negatively impacts your life, their choice impacts your life, which means you didn't make that choice. You just got the results of it. You have more claim on the atonement. You can pray and ask God to help you more in your life. You have more of an opportunity to have the Savior with you than, in, than on normal day. So realize that. It is there for you. It is there to help you. And it's still there, just like it was in the, these ancient days. We don't have to do a sacrifice for it now. We just have to pray and ask God to help us in our life and then put faith in him that he will help us and watch the miracles happen. So thanks for watching. I hope you're enjoying these videos. Uh, like, comment on the videos as well. Uh, we'd love to hear your opinions and thoughts and share them if you have other people you want to share them with as well. We'd love to introduce more people to understanding the gospel better. Thanks.